Um, my name is Kristen Antelman. I'm the Associate Director for the Digital Library at North Carolina State University. And this is Morris York, Head of IT for the NCSU Libraries. And we're here today to talk to you about the library building as a research platform. Uh, with the opportunity to build a new uh, library at NC State, which we'll tell you a bit more about in a second, we were presented with the uh, enviable opportunity to think deeply about what does a research library mean uh, going forward. And you know, kind of specifically, uh, what, what is the physical research library going forward uh, in, in, in a, the post-print environment? So I'm going to start with a little bit of the story of how we got to the vision, and then Morris will uh, take it over and talk about the specific implementations of creating the research program and spaces and partnerships for the Hunt Library. Uh, before I get off the, uh, the uh, starting slide here, I just wanted to mention that this was a, uh, we did a student contest called My Hunt Library, where stu we asked students to take pictures of the new library, and we got over uh, 1,700 submissions, and this was the winning photo. This was a, a, a student in front of our immersion theater. The site of the new Hunt Library is a Centennial Campus, which is a 1,000-acre research campus adjacent to NC State's main campus. Uh, Centennial exemplifies the vision of academic, corporate, and government partnership. It was significantly inspired by the Research Triangle Park model. And in fact, um, the former governor, James B. Hunt, Jr., after whom our new library is named, uh, was the person that secured the land for NC State 25 years ago when he was governor of North Carolina. Uh, the library was funded by the legislature in 2007, uh, which was actually very fortuitous because if it had been come up for funding the next year, it probably would never have happened. So when the library started to engage with the campus community about the vision, uh, we tried to explore the question of what is the value proposition for a new library on a science and engineering technology campus in the early 21st century. The entire College of Engineering, which NC State is the fourth largest college of engineering, uh, in the U.S. It is located on this campus or will be uh, eventually when the full campus is built out. So there were, of course, many threads uh, that we could have drawn on here that, that emerged from these conversations with people. And so we're really just able to follow a few of those uh, to their natural conclusion today. Um, one uh, is clearly that all of you know that data-driven science is clearly a core environmental context for research that uh, libraries need to respond to. And you know, li many libraries have already done a lot of uh, great work in defining how they can support data-driven science through the buildings, through building infrastructure and services to support data curation and so on. But not, a, not as many libraries have built uh, physical infrastructure to support these new research, research methodologies. So we were asked, asked ourselves the question, do we want to limit ourselves to archiving the results of the research, or do we have a role to play in creating the platform to support creation of the research itself? Back in 1998, which I guess is 15 years ago, uh, David Lewis uh, wrote this article, which had a, an enormous impact on me at the time. And I, I, I still, uh, it's kind of a touchstone for me in my thinking about libraries over the years. He asked um, this question that posed by the title of this uh, article, what if libraries are artifact-bound institutions? And he wrote at that time, I still think that this is a profound challenge to us. And I think it actually has new resonance when we, when we think of this question in the context of the f future of the physical research library. He wrote then, libraries are artifact-bound institutions, and as such, will be replaced as the dominant technology for information communication as uh, the dominant technology for information communication moves from tangible objects to electronic bits on a network. As this transition occurs, it is important to understand not what libraries have done, but rather what they are for. They are the means through which organizations and communities subsidize the distribution of information to residents and members. And he further asks, as the library fades as the channel for the subsidy, it is critical that the subsidy itself is not lost. And I think this is very much a living question. I mean, clearly, we're still subsidizing books and journals and collections. Are there, so you know, taking that question uh, into the present, uh, are there resources connected with knowledge creation at the present time that were like books and journals in the past for which the library is the logical entity to manage an institutional subsidy? So returning to the uh, data-driven science 
core use case. That kind of shows where we were, right? We still pay $22,000 for those four journals. The university is also asking this question, of course, right? So looking at data-driven science, the university is looking at shared investments uh, in resources that may not necessarily be the best uh, place, it, the be best housed in the library, right? Like so, uh, very expensive uh, microscopes, for instance. Uh, universities are looking at how those can become shared resources to pool the investment for resources like that. But returning to the uh, idea of data-driven science, that core use case uh, is a visual data analysis uh, that, that is often uh, often associated with with the uh, big research data. And it's a core tool for both, both analysis and exploration of data. And I think this is the, this is the one that we really decided to focus in on uh, with the Hunt Library. Um, we're not alone in this, of course. We see that several other libraries are also engaged uh, with this question and visualization spaces. And these examples are from uh, Brown University, the recent issue of Nature that featured Johns Hopkins. And this is the University of Calgary uh, visualization spaces in libraries. Uh, our friends down the road, Duke University, also have also have visualization spaces and programs. So uh, we, we built on the visualization and collaboration as kind of the core anchors for the technology vision for Hunt. I mean, there's really a lot more than that, but it's kind of what a, a core anchor for, for, for our research program. And Morris will get into the detail of, of that story in a bit. But I just wanted to take a slight diversion and talk about um, why I think NCSU Libraries was particularly well positioned to be fairly aggressive in uh, the vision for this new library. Uh, just 30 years ago, we were really not a research library at all. We were really a not very good college library. So we weren't even kind of leading in the scope in which uh, we, we existed back in that time. And you can see by the budget growth that we've become uh, research library level uh, funded library o over over a really rapid uh, period of a short period of time, right? Uh, and I think what we really did is we uh, bootstrapped our way into being a research library through the deliberate strategy to invest in new technologies. So and that includes both uh, collections and technology staff. I think that's a critical point. Uh, but on the electronic collection side, I just want, this is another little diversion, but back in 1990, uh, John Unsworth was a faculty member in, in the Department of English at NC State, and he and a few colleagues approached uh, the then, then and still director of our library, Susan Nutter, asking for assistance to start up this new journal. And that was, this was a time when there were really very few uh, electronic scholarly journals, electronic only. And it was quite, quite controversial. Uh, so what the library did is partner with the Department of English that didn't really have a lot of resources to support a venture like this, and it provided uh, staff, or it provided uh, some space and supplies and, and places to meet and uh, assistance with uh, copyright issues and things like that, and, and, also, and then, and then uh, subsequently partnered in a, a conference to talk about the future of electronic journals. And I think that really helped, gave a nice uh, shot in the arm to this type of uh, forward thinking in the area of digital collections. So this is just a little uh, sidelight, but I think it's really part and parcel of where we are today. So fast forward 17 years, the new library has been funded, and through a competitive international competition process has selected the lead designer, to Snohetta. And I think uh, Snohetta was critical to our success with their vision and their willingness to kind of partner with us and, and, and not you know, have any pre come in with any preconceptions of what this library would be. You may know Snohetta as the designers of the uh, Library of Alexandrina, as well as the Oslo, award-winning Oslo Opera House project, which are pictured there. Uh, the local architect was pbc and L, and you know, both pbc and L and Snohetta will say that that collaboration was the best in their careers. They had, they had never had such a productive and creative collaboration between them. Uh, Skanska was the construction firm, uh, and if any of you have done uh, building projects, you know that they are a critical member of the design team, critical for success, and we worked with the Sextant Group as our AB consultants.
And I really just want to say again before I go off the slide that without any one of these partners just really stepping to the table and willing to be creative and work with us, uh, this project would never have been possible with the budget that we had. So it pretty quickly became apparent back in 2007, 2008, that we needed, uh, a, a, before we could get to an actual technology plan for the building, we needed a technology vision statement, a pretty well elaborated uh, upon a vision statement early in the design phase. This document, which was provided to the internal leadership team as well as the design team, was critical for coalescing around the vision, especially uh, internal conversations in, in the library, I have to say. It was really a starting point for our work with the AV consultants. It allowed us to really control that narrative rather than having them come in and tell us what, the, what kind of technology spaces they were going to build. We were working with them on, uh, on guiding that conversation. The strategy that this document took was to carry the concepts and lessons that we had learned from our successful 2007 Learning Commons project into very new territory, uh, showing that we could build on what was widely acknowledged to be uh, existing successes uh, especially internally, enabled us to significantly expand the program for technology at Hunt. And we were inspired by many, so this is the, uh, the, the, the Learning Commons uh, projects at NC State. But taking that to kind of the next level, we were inspired by, you know, particularly just focusing on the visualization area, and this is the kind of material that that vision document contained. It contained examples, lots of visuals. It was full of visuals. And we found right, we knew our core audience loved visuals. It's our core internal audience, at least to start. And it ended up being a very effective strategy uh, more broadly as well. We provided visuals like this about what could, what could the, the, the library be. And two of these three are non-library spaces. Actually, all three are non-library spaces. The one in the lower left was probably kind of our linchpin inspiration, the University of Sussex Creativity Zone. Uh, it really uh, served as the, as the driving force for, for, for much of what we, you see in the library. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So these are the core principles that emerged and that were really our foundational talking points for all audiences during the design process. And we wrapped these principles under the overarching concept, the library as technology incubator. Uh, each of these, but each of these really has a dual meaning. It's both kind of pointed to the current, what we view as our current successes and our kind of core cultural values as a library in the present, what the Learning Commons was already doing, but also I think somewhat subversively pointed to a very different future vision and one that was much more closely tied to the future and to the research library mission of the university than the Learning Commons had been. I mean, learning, our Learning Commons, like all Learning Commons, is really focused on uh, undergraduate and, and study space and so on. So fa fast forward five more years, and we had our grand opening yesterday. <laughs> Morris and I actually ran out of the party <laughs> to come to the airport to come here. Uh, it's quite exciting. And what we see here is just some pictures from the opening itself yesterday. And a few uh, tweets about how students feel about the library. Uh, even though we're not focusing on that aspect of it today, I think that it's fundamentally com complementary to the success of the library uh, research mission. And now I'm going to turn it over to Morris, who's going to get into the actual details of what we did and show you some more pictures of the spaces. Okay, so um, some of these tweets are actually a really great launching off point into where we're going to go with what, what this becomes as a research platform, the core topic of the talk. Um, the, the pictures that we saw, these tweets, really what people experience when they walk into this library is first and foremost an experience of awe, right? It's just incredibly beautiful. Uh, and that really opens up their imaginations, which is what we wanted. It was like to walk into this library, people walk in here and see something that they had never seen before and really open up their conception of what a library could be and how they could interact with it. Um, and, and we have evidence of that, right? So now we take that feeling of awe 
and wonder and inspiration, and we dig down deep and say, what can we do to actually take that and leverage it to promote the research enterprise at the university and how we augment that and provide something new of value. So what I'm going to talk about uh, primarily is how we go about looking at the library building, not just putting research spaces into a library, not just putting learning spaces into a library, but turning the facility itself into an integrated holistic platform for research. So I'll talk a little bit about the infrastructure and then as well uh, some of our uh, research use cases, the partners we've drawn into the space, and how they're starting to use it today. Um, so our core focus areas, as we ask this question, what is the, li uh, the, the research library as a facility for these high-tech disciplines, for the research that happens today, primarily based in uh, compute research, big data, and things like that. Uh, the value we found we could provide was in large-scale display, visualization, uh, interactive computing. These were things that were not present on campus in any sort of uh, organized way. Um, there were pots, there were places that you could do large scale visualization and data work, uh, primarily you know, within colleges and places that were uh, fairly restricted, things that you couldn't really get access to. So thinking about what could we provide in a central community place, a 24 hour facility that could really provide uh, extraordinary value for the entire university as well as these disciplines, large scale visualization and display uh, was a clear niche where we could move into. Uh, and then the communications and collaboration uh, particularly, and then piloting and developing new technologies. This core idea of becoming a sandbox for technology and providing this facility where we can continually roll in the latest technologies for the students and faculty to work with. Uh, so the spaces that we designed within that building, uh, particularly black box and white box spaces. So this went to the idea of, of sort of infinite flexibility in, uh, in our spaces. I actually clearly remember the meeting where we sat down and, and Kristen and I had been lobbying for this. Everything has to be flexible. We need to change it around. And the, one of the architects kind of you know, threw their papers on the table and said, you know, at some point we've got to put down steel and we've got to put concrete around it. You know? <laughs> There's no such thing as infinite flexibility. Uh, but these few spaces were really where we took that idea to its logical conclusion. So they're built like black box theaters for technology. Uh, the teaching and viz lab is pictured here. Uh, you can see this is actually a shot from yesterday. Uh, we're standing inside of the Colosseum in Rome. Uh, so it has stereoscopic capabilities. It's 270 degree projection. We can create those kind of immersive 3D visual environments. Uh, and it also has 3D sound capabilities, which I'll talk about. Uh, but we can use these spaces you know, to repurpose on a daily, a weekly basis uh, for teaching research, the technology research and development, uh, creating uh, immersive environments for visualization. Uh, but we can also use that kind of black box environment. No matter what technology throws at us, we know that it changes too fast for any of us to keep up with. The, the rooms themselves can adapt, and we can roll in the latest technologies. Uh, this is our white box space, so what I mean by white box is basically take the same infrastructure principles but steal some ideas from gallery spaces and from studios. Uh, this has movable whiteboard walls, uh, the 10 feet high and 4 feet wide, so you can actually reconfigure the physical interior of the room. Uh, it's got theater lighting kits, uh, a curtain wall system, um, a projection on every wall. We got rid of all the screens that we could and actually just painted everything in projection quality paint. We can project on any wall, project on the floors. Uh, the students, when they first took tours of these spaces, started to affectionately to refer to them as the holodeck. Um, so for all of us Trekkies, it was very gratifying to see that actually every piece of the building began to become associated with some part of the Starship Enterprise. Uh, so great for brainstorming, simulation, active collaboration. Uh, this is one, sh one side of the Creativity Studio, and they're doing visualization work there. Uh, and this is the same side of that now converted into a maritime skills simulator for the Navy. So what they do up there is this, we're looking at a, 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 a ship simulation. Uh, they can drive any ship in the fleet, so they change it from a battleship to aircraft carrier, destroyer, submarine, uh, and actually simulate the correct layout of any bridge on any of those ships and conduct ship simulations and training uh, for their midshipmen. Uh, and then to complement those black box spaces are large scale interactive displays. So we have uh, five giant um, display walls throughout the building, all of them running at four to eight times the resolution of your standard HD TV. Uh, I actually counted the other day and we have over 100 million pixels of 
uh, display capability throughout the building. Um, your standard TV in your living room has two million pixels, and that hundred million is not even counting all of the you know, uh, LCD and plasma screens we have all over the building. That's just high resolution display wall capability. Uh, and this is our game lab. Uh, the first one was our immersion theater. This is our game lab. Uh, this was specifically designed for the gaming research program uh, at NC State, which is one of the top gaming programs in the country. Uh, the undergraduate program is focused on the entertainment gaming industry. The graduate program is focused on serious games, uh, applications of gaming to artificial intelligence, medicine, data modeling, and that sort of thing. And uh, finally, our display walls throughout the rest of the building. Um, they're talking about our teaching visualization wall on the right is the most unusual. Uh, it's built up into, into stripped uh, displays. We really wanted to mix up, get out of the 1920 by 1080 box uh, and work with all sorts of different resolutions, different uh, aspect ratios, different configurations of displays to really work with concepts of how do we visualize the data world? How do we interact with the compute world? And what are the different ways that we can start to see into that world? Um, so, as we make a transition from those physical spaces, so my, uh, my I guess you would call it a meme now, um, is that fit great physical research spaces require great virtual spaces behind them. Um, our conclusion with this building was it was not for, you know, half a dozen uh, high profile researchers on campus, it was not for one specific college. These technologies in the spirit of a library actually had to be made available to everyone from your second week undergraduate all the way up to our most uh, advanced researchers who had NSF grants and were working with the DOD and so forth, uh, which meant that they had to be very accessible. You, didn't ha you, you couldn't take, have to take a six month training course to get into these spaces and know the secret handshake and have talked to all of the right people, right? These are blown wide open. There's no limits to access, there's no restrictions. 24-hour spaces that anybody can use. In order to do that, we had to build the virtual and cloud infrastructure uh, behind that. We had to make these sorts of large graphics applications, the tools to use them uh, easily portable. You couldn't tell researchers that where they were doing their research out on the campus HPC, but in order to come in and use the Viz Lab, well, you gotta do it on our machines and you gotta start all over again and all that. It had to integrate out into the campus research infrastructure. Uh, not only campus research infrastructure, but throughout the park. So going out to Duke, to UNC, throughout North Carolina, and all the collaborations that we have across the nation and across the globe. Uh, so our focus on, was on graphics intensive applications, of course. We're working with big visuals, uh, rendering, you know, so we have uh, a render farm, which I'll talk a little bit about. But obviously, if you're working with four and eight, eight K graphics, which they call ultra H HD now, and asking students to create that level of intensive uh, um, motion graphics, uh, you can't just you know, tell them, well, you know, uh, yeah, that's going to take maybe two years to render out. So you know, come back when you're a senior, and we'll give you your passing grade for that. Right? It's got to work very quickly. It's got to snap. Um, so from the get-go, the entire uh, program of technology in the building to use those sorts of physical spaces was about virtualization. It was virtualize everything. Sync everything down into the data center, have all of the computing, all the rendering, uh, all of the, the graphics manipulation happen in the server room, and they get pushed up the backbone. So we actually have, we removed about 95% of the equipment that would have been up on the floors and in the labs, and sank that all down into the server room and we just send visual results uh, up the backbone. Uh, once we sync everything down into the data center, it's all right next to each other, it's racks away, an aisle away from each other. Now we can expand that out into the cloud environment. Uh, so creating that sort of central compute cloud, the new concept here was project cloud space. So creating a web interface where anybody could go in and say, you know, I need three desktops, I need two servers, I need a virtual network to connect them, I need, you know, 50 terabytes of storage for the project that I'm going to be doing, and I need that for three months, right? So now, instead of checking out books or research materials, we're actually checking out compute power to them. Uh, and we can come back at the end of that lease and say, hey, do you want to save that off? Do you want to take your VMDK over to your own college infrastructure? Do you want us to just blow it away? Do you want us to archive that for you? 
Uh, and then we extend that out to external compute cloud uh, providers, so people that are working with uh, you know, NetApp, Amazon, uh, other sorts of cloud providers, uh, and then extend all of that out through communications infrastructure. So through video conferencing, um, capture, broadcast, we actually you know, completely blow the walls off the library. We can invite people from anywhere in the world into the space and, and allow them to be active collaborators with the research that's taking place in the building. So research infrastructure, as, as we put that, that sort of um, uh, concept into place, the places that we really, uh, well, okay, that happened too fast. Um, I hope you caught all of that. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to talk fast. <laughs> the private cloud, HPC and render farm, display servers, any-to-any uh, -any display, conference and capture, high-speed network, and high-performance storage. Uh, on the network in particular, we're working with a 40-gig internal backbone inside of the server room, uh, and this is actually a schematic of that, so I'll just talk from this. 40-gig uh, internal backbone inside of the server room, um, uh, 10 gig drops to all the major pieces of equipment, 10 gig backbone uh, up the back of the building, and then um, 10 gig out to all the major of pieces of equipment that are still upstairs. Uh, so ultra high speed uh, bandwidth there, we actually have two networks in the building. One is a switched IP network. The other one is a dedicated fiber backbone just for pumping all of that graphical information because we wanted to remove that from the data stream. Uh, moving over into the cloud infrastructure, that's housed down there as well, um, creating that sort of dynamic cloud environment where we can allow people to create their own resources, to check them out, where we can do analysis of usage, work that down into the usage of the resources, and reporting um, for you know, grant purposes out on how many compute, compute sources they used, what, how many cycles, and, and put a monetary quantification on that. And then the research computing itself, uh, we do have a small HPC cluster in the building. We don't need to be campus HPC, we've got that. It's enough local computing com uh, power that they can bring their applications, their data and so forth into the building close to the graphics infrastructure and run their, uh, run their experiments, run their research in, their, in the visualization lab and resources like that. Um, we have a render farm, uh, so it's about 40 nodes of, HP, of high performance computing altogether. Uh, 16 nodes of that is carved off just for rendering, and another tw 24 for a traditional HPC stack. Uh, this is all graphics accelerated, so we're doing GPGPU. Uh, we're focusing on the graphics uh, computing. I uh, also have about 110 terabytes of very high performance research storage um, from EMC and Dell. Uh, and then all of our uh, display workstations, everything that drives all the big walls are also uh, down there in the basement as well. So you can be in there in, uh, in Maya, creating your 3D environment, throw that to the render farm, and then have the display servers pick that up and ship it up to the backbone all over that 40 gig network. So everything happens very fast. And then as we pipe that up to the high tech spaces upstairs, like I said, that's that 10 gig backbone and 10 gig drops to all of the rooms uh, upstairs in the building. Um, just to take a little bit of a walk through, uh, for use cases now about how we use that. So again, I said it's not just dropping research spaces into a library, it's creating that as a holistic platform for research. So we're looking at life cycle, right? Research has many different aspects of a life cycle, as we know. Uh, it's not about just walking up to that screen and throwing up the visualization. There's a whole process of work that goes behind that, and the building has to adapt to that entire life cycle. Uh, so everything from very early stages, um, you know, in somewhere like the creativity studio with lots of whiteboard walls, that kind of ideation, uh, the brainstorming, a lot of that physical work that can go on with sketching out ideas, uh, to the viz lab, right, a closed space, lock the doors, black box, can do all sorts of that messy early work on the research, throw up lots of ideas and, and throw away 90% of it because it doesn't work. Uh, going out to media production, now we're actually producing those graphics, we're working with that data, we're in a high, you know, a high performance, using lots of different applications and manipulating all of that into presentation-worthy uh, form. Uh, interactive computing, we're actually putting those applications out for people to use. And then the graphics-intensive applications, we're taking that out more into public spaces, 
uh, places where we want to do demonstration, where we're trying to teach with it, where we're trying to bring other people into the research process to get that feedback loop, and finally to present the results of those research and broadcast them out to the community. So to take a, a specific instantiation of that uh, with gaming, like I mentioned gaming is a, is a huge cornerstone of what we're doing with the library. One, because gaming leads a lot of technology, it leads a lot of use cases, and it allows us to dig down into other aspects of research areas. Uh, so with gaming, right, so we can start, start with that concept development, uh, ideation and design, uh, move into the Viz Lab for that early uh, prototyping and proof of concept work, come over into the media production labs for the cinematics, the graphics, the animations, uh, and then go down into the game lab for that kind of critique, gameplay, demonstration. And to show how the cloud environment weaves into that, all of that is backed by the cloud. You don't have to think about what room has the right computer in it, where the applications are installed, how do I get my data in there. You walk into any space, you log into the network, and all of your stuff is just there. So it's really thinking about what space is the most appropriate for me, and stop thinking about where's the application and what computer is driving it. Uh, so when we're talking about gaming, uh, as I said, we, you have those graphics workstations where you're doing a lot of that coding and creation. Uh, the render farm for producing uh, the assets, development servers where you're housing a lot of the code, the gameplay clients, uh, code repository, and being able to push that out now to all of your mobile clients, your laptops, your devices. So finally now digging down into the research itself. And what do we really mean by enabling research in the building? There's many different aspects of that, three primarily that I'll focus on. One is the platform research, so research on the building itself as a platform. How do we continuously keep that developing and keep the technology fresh? Uh, applications research, how do we build the tools to allow people to use that platform? Just putting it out there isn't enough. They walk into the building, they get frustrated, and they never come back again, right? We've got to give them the tools to be able to work with it. And then academic research. Right? Okay, so these are the grants. This is you know, coming in with your NSF grant, your DOD grant, your, your uh, National Humanities grant. All of that that we really think of as traditional academic research. Um, so the platform is really about, the research is about creating adaptable, adaptable infrastructure and technology integration. When we get into the applications, we're trying to create that, uh, an API for the building essentially, that extensible API, reusable frameworks for how the building functions. Uh, and then when you get into the academic research, that's a pure research knowledge advancement. Uh, and there's a, a specific area of investment associated with each of these, right? So we have to create new models of investment, new models of sustainability. Uh, the platform itself is about uh, corporate investment. Uh, this is the spirit of Centennial Campus, academic and, part, uh, and corporate partners working together. Uh, the extensible APIs come from community investment, asking our community to create those APIs that allow everybody else in the community to use the research platform. So this is the shared community investment. Uh, and finally, uh, on the academic research side, the grant investment, bringing in those dollars, getting writ written into the grants, having the entire research community think about this building as an enabler for, for their grant work. Uh, so just quickly, I'll run through a couple of elements here, just as examples. Uh, so platform research, uh, we're really talking about how does the facility function, how does the hardware function, um, what kind of technologies are we using. Uh, just as an example, so um, we designed a traditional technology design for a building of this scale is about two years behind the curve. They want to make sure the stuff works. You don't go out on the bleeding edge because then it doesn't work and, you know, it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, what we continuously pushed for throughout the design process was don't put us behind the curve. If we start two years behind the curve, we're way too far behind for a research platform. Research is always on the leading edge. So the facility itself had to be the latest, the most recently released, the cutting edge technologies. Now there's a cost to that, <laughs> which is that some of the stuff that we plan to install in the building hasn't even been released yet, <laughs> right? So we're still waiting a few months for some of the technologies to actually become available on the market so that we can put them in the building. But that's all in the spirit of it. That's exactly what we want, right? Now, there's a threshold. If you get like more than half of your technology is not even released yet, well, 
that's a little, uh, a lot of sleepless nights, shall we say. Um, but it's where we want to be. And, the, and these are uh, some of the companies that we're working with. We have over 14 corporate partners who have come to the table to invest in this idea with us, uh, to use the building for their own platform for research as well. If you put this, uh, these um, beta technologies, things that haven't been released or proven, out into you know, AT&T and you get it wrong, they could lose billions of dollars an hour. But if you put it into a safe research environment where the idea is when stuff breaks, that's how we learn, right? So this becomes a very compelling uh, environment for these companies to work in. So for applications research, this was a, a student uh, a PhD student in computer science. This was a blog post that came out within the first week that the building was open in January. Uh, and I'll just read a couple of pieces of it, but what I would have loved to see is an API for Hunt Library itself. Okay, so the building opened and basically there was no technology in it, right? It was stunning, beautiful facility, lots of furniture, but you couldn't find a computer anywhere, right? So what I would have loved to see is an API for Hunt Library itself. Imagine if students actually had an interface where they could write apps for the library, right? Give us the tools to add to the library. So they walked in immediately knew that this was something different, right? This is something I should be able to create with, but I can't because I don't have the right tools. So give me the API. Uh, and that's essentially what we're doing with the applications research, right? Create the frameworks, create the reusable components. We don't do one-off projects for anyone, right? We have developers, we have designers, we have consultants. We don't take one faculty project and say, we'll build this for you and it only works for you, but it'll be great because you'll be able to finish your research, right? We pass those aside because it's not sustainable. We can't keep that up. So when we take on a project, we look for the things where we can create a framework, where they'll partner with us, they'll build something that's reusable, where the next faculty member that comes along, we can say, hey, someone already did that, and we know exactly how to drop your stuff into it. Uh, just to give you one example, um, actually I'll save it. I'll come to a really good example of that uh, later on, and in the interest of time, I'll just leave this one there. Uh, and then on the academic research side, so this is my transition, uh, where we'll talk about a couple of our specific projects. Um, clearly with making this kind of technology and facility investment, uh, you don't want to just walk out and then the first time someone asks the question of, okay, who would use that and what would they would do with it? You got to have something in your back pocket, right? Hopefully a couple of somethings. <laughs> so they don't start asking, you know, that, that conversation could go on forever if you can't put the right stuff in them to prove why you did this in the first place, particularly at a state institution. Uh, so these are a couple of our core use cases, uh, you know, creating big data harvesters and business analytics for the College of Management. Uh, maritime skills with the U.S. Naval training, I showed you a picture of that one. Uh, gaming design, AI, uh, virtual crime scene investigation, which was one of the coolest. I'm sorry I can't show you more of that. Uh, creating virtual forestry environments and things of this nature. Uh, Paul, St. Paul's Cathedral I'll talk about more in depth right now. So like I said, this as soon as we started creating this, the core use cases were engineering, computer science, textiles, which is actually an extraordinarily high-tech discipline these days. Um, but it extends to the entire university. As soon as you create an environment like this, it actually, you walk out the door and you start tripping across people that could use this. So digital humanities was one, right? Uh, and that's John Wall up in the corner working with uh, Joshua Stevens and David Hill. This was a multidisciplinary uh, effort to create a virtual reconstruction of St. Paul's Cathedral, which burned down in the London fire, 1666. The research question was, what would it be like to stand in the courtyard of St. Paul's Cathedral in Paul's Cross and listen to John Donne deliver a sermon? So they built the whole 3D environment. They did lots of cool stuff like sonar plunging of the original foundations of the building, uh, exploration of the original documents in the lower corner there is one of the original sketches of the cathedral, and create a full 3D environment. And then don't stop there, but give that over to sound engineers who can now look at the reflection properties of that environment and look at what the, the, the acoustical properties of, of that space would have been in 1622 in London and actually recreate that sound environment. Um, so then we can go into the visualiz visualization lab where I mentioned we have 3D audio capabilities as well as 3D visuals. And what all 3D audio means is the same acoustical environment that we walk around in every day on the street. 
So your traditional sound environment of what they call surround sound, there's kind of a sound on the left, kind of a sound on the right. 3D sound is I can get down to the level of creating a fly buzzing around your head, and you can hear exactly where that is, and you can turn your head in space, and that sound shifts as you turn your head. So take that into a virtual forestry environment. Now we can change the shape of the room into a hilltop in North Carolina. We can place birdsong half a mile away and have those birds migrate around through the trees, and you can actually follow them and identify what species of birdsong you're listening to, all without leaving that room. So we switch over to Paul's Cross, and now you're in the courtyard of St. Paul's Cathedral. You're listening to John Dunn deliver a sermon. You can change the crowd size from 25 to 100 people. You can cue a flock of birds to fly overhead. You can stand in the back of the courtyard next to the apple cart and see what that was like, or move right up next to Paul's Cross, the pulpit station itself, and listen right in front of it. Uh, and finally, just as a last example of some of the um, academic research applications, uh, on the upper right there, looking at 3D visualization, uh, we have a faculty member who wants to move into that viz lab and use the 3D uh, projection capabilities to look at plant cell component mobility through cell walls, which is apparently an extraordinary th difficult thing to explain. But putting in a visualization environment like that, now we can demonstrate it and skip a lot of that confusion and, and just difficulty in explaining what the environment is like. The innovation is there is we put that visualization into the Unity game environment, so leveraging our gaming component, uh, and they can interact with it in a live gaming uh, environment now. So to go back to the example of reusable frameworks, this is the concept for the Viz Lab. Anybody that has a 3D model, we're creating a Unity game environment that's tuned to the properties of that room, can leverage the sound capabilities, and all you have to do is give us your model, and we can drop it in there, and you magically have an instant visualization interactive environment. Uh, on the lower left there, 3D quantification. So not just working with, all, all visualization is, is sensory represent, representation of data so we can gain some new knowledge that we wouldn't have had if we just looked at the raw numbers and data itself. So that happens not just in the visual world, but in the oral world as well. So Sina Barum, uh, who was um, identified as one of the White House uh, champions of change very recently, uh, he is blind, and so his research is, how do we take data and represent it in a 3D sound environment so that you can experience data through 3D sound and interact with it in a 3D sound space? So you can imagine if you took that plant cell visualization and you were blind, it wouldn't do you any good. But if you could represent that through sound, now you have a very rich interactive environment where you can take that data and gain some new value from it. So finally, uh, just to conclude, to tie it all back in, this is how we uh, envision this building as a research platform. Uh, it will take us a couple of years just to prove out this concept. It's entirely new. There aren't good models for this anywhere. We are trying to build a new model for what this kind of a research platform looks like. At the same time, we are very conscious that there are many important applications of this kind of technology. <laughs> and we want to acknowledge them all. <laughs> that is the NCAA uh, tournament. Unfortunately, we were kicked out in the first round. So I was standing here going, oh, the Wolfpack is losing. That's terrible. But wait, that's really cool. <laughs> so it was a conflicted sort of moment. Uh, but that's the Hunt Library, and that's the research platform we're creating. <laughs>